Welcome to Globally Speaking, your program that explores everything and anything to do with language localization. Are you ready to dive into the most critical issues impacting global brands today? Globally Speaking is designed to educate, inform, and challenge everyone who's engaged in global communications. Your hosts for Globally Speaking are Renato Beninato and Michael Stevens. Learn more by visiting our website at www.globallyspeakingradio.com. And now, here are Renato and Michael. Welcome to Globally Speaking. I'm Michael Stevens. I'm Renato Beninato. And we're sitting here in beautiful Monterey, California. Life does not get much better than this. It's true. And we have an important guest today. We do. We do. We're privileged to be speaking with Dino Pick today. Dino has an illustrious background. A couple of things I'd like to highlight in Dino. I, I'd, we'd love to hear more from you. You were the Iraq country desk officer in the office of the Secretary of Defense. You were the commandant. That's a word I need to get nailed in my vocabulary, but it commandant at the Defense Language Institute for Foreign Language Center. Just think of Stalag 13. So, Stalag 13. Okay. <laughs> um, the commandant. <laughs> or minions, I think, also. There that's, you go. that's my reference, Perfect. right? <laughs> the, um, and you still serve as the chairman of the board there? Is that uh, correct? The foundation. That's right. Or the yeah. foundation. Okay. And you're currently serving as deputy city manager here in beautiful Monterey. So in Monterey, so is called the language capital of the world. Why is that? So great question. First of all, it's great to be here with you guys. I'm so glad you're here in Monterey, and, and we're, we're thrilled that Moravia is here as well. So Monterey, in the early 90s, was coined the language capital of the world by some local folks because it's home to the Defense Language Institute, the Monterey Institute for International Studies, the Naval Postgraduate School, which has a robust language program, and as well as some of the businesses that were here at the time, ATT, Language Line Services, and so on. That sort of faded out over the years, and a few years ago, we were able to reinvigorate it. So we trademarked Monterey's language capital of the world, mm. and when I say we, specifically the Monterey County Business Council, put in the resources to, to trademark that term, and we started doing a pretty robust public outreach and, and some celebrations in town which had some some wonderful results. Yeah, it's a pretty big branding shift from being known for Cannery Row and Steinbeck. And how effective has it been, do you feel? Yeah, a, another great question. So we were, you know, of course, Monterey is known for golf. They're known for tourism is a huge part of our economy. Wasn't Clint Eastwood the mayor here? Right down the road, oh, yeah. Carmel by the Sea. Oh, Carmel, exactly, yeah. but uh, but you're exactly right. So a lot of, lot of star power and, and glitz. <laughs> and of course, uh, the agriculture sector is huge here. So language was was not as well known, and we were glad to start to sing those praises of, our, of these institutions and these resources. And as part of that branding effort, about a year ago, a company called Moravia yeah. reached out to Monterey County Business Council, and and we're we're really proud, really proud here in Monterey to to be able to say that we're we're now hosting a a business unit of Moravia, and that we think is a result of that branding and that outreach. Yeah, and there's a full other list of companies. You mentioned a few of them in passing, but Language Line is headquarters. Language Line is here. You have Media right. Locate is another company that is local. There are several. There are uh, Venga. I think had, was here for a while. So That's it's right. effective. Well, the, the the important thing is that you have access to language resources here because you have students from all over the world the the what well, they changed name is not Monterey Institute anymore it's yeah that's right Middlebury Institute Middlebury. of International yes. Studies that's the right the Middlebury Institute has students from i think 70 countries here yes. and these are native students doing postgraduate students MBA classes and that's a very important resource for us it's a concentration of talent that it's is very important but I, i'm curious about the side that we don't know so much about, which is the military side. Mm. Why is the Defense Language Institute here? Why was the, or is the Naval Institute here? What kind of language training is provided? Because I understand from history, I don't know where, if, if it is a fact, that- That's never you, stopped us. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> the top language school in the world where you really learn languages efficiently, it's the DLI. Mm. Well, you know, so I'm a little partial. I, I commanded the school for four years. That's and fine. So it runs in my veins, as Bob can, can attest. So DLI started a few months before 
Pearl Harbor as the Army Language School up in San Francisco, classified school teaching Japanese language. It has grown since then to the flagship institution that it is today, teaching about 3,800 students. All of them are military. They're from all four services. The vast majority are very young, have no backgrounds in the languages that they're studying, but have demonstrated on a, a very rigorous aptitude test called the Defense Language Aptitude Battery, the aptitude for language learning. Mm -hmm. And so I used to tell this story to my students when I would speak to them. Every week we start classes and every week we graduate. So it's a rolling process at DLI. And I used to tell this story. And that, that is, I grew up speaking Assyrian, Aramaic. So I was bilingual in the house, studied Spanish for five years, like most of us in high school and junior high, went to college and studied Persian Farsi at the University of Washington and majored in it. Four mm -hmm. years of language major. And the pace of language study at DLI hit me like a bus. It eclipsed what you had done before. <laughs> I mean, I learned more <laughs> Arabic than I had learned Farsi in four years of college after the first two months. Oh. At DLI. But is it the methodology? I was worried, wondering it, the same yeah, thing. No, great questions. Uh, so, Ronaldo, so when you start at DLI, it's a near immersive environment is the way I would characterize it. So, eight hours a day of intensive language study, two to four hours of homework a night for either six, 12, or 15 months, depending on how long your language course is. So, it just builds and builds and builds very, very rapidly. And it brings you to a, a point of proficiency at the end of that course that is unlike anything produced in our universities wow. and frankly anything I've, I've ever seen anywhere around the world. So we have a confirmed source that has told us because of this rapid language learning that is it in the third month that you start dreaming in the language? It is. It's very soon in, in the language course and it's, and it's kind of an unnatural thing. I mean, when you're a monolingual person as the vast majority of Americans are to have a dream in, a, in another language little unsettling. But again, so what makes that possible is an amazing faculty of civilians that are native speakers of the languages they're teaching from the countries, bring the culture, bring the religions, bring all of the experiences from those countries into the classroom and make what I referred to earlier as this near immersive experience so rich. It's remarkable. What is the biggest language that you have here? Arabic. Arabic. But it's changed over time. So you can imagine. You started to use when Japanese. Japanese. Was the first. Yeah. Then, of course, you know, over the years, Russian during the Cold War was the largest language. Vietnamese became a, a large language during the Vietnam conflict. So it's driven by war. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it actually is. It, as, as we were talking about this podcast uh, today, I said we we're going to get to hear some war stories yeah. this, this evening. And it, like, no, not figuratively, literal war stories yeah. because of this. Because But what you the do. Russians also have a very advanced training program for langu linguists. And is it a similar methodology? Do we know about it? Because there was a, this super learning approach yeah. is that it they had in the 70s. Are we in a race with them on that too? You know, we're so much better. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the answer is, I, I honestly, I don't know their methodology. I do know that the customers of our graduates at DLI, which was, is the federal government, the Department of Defense primarily, and the intelligence community more specifically, are very pleased. Mm. They're very pleased with the product. And if I can highlight for a moment the Arabic, anyone that studied Arabic knows what modern standard Arabic is. It's sort of Quranic, classic Arabic. And forever... That's how you learned Arabic in an academic setting. You learned modern standard Arabic. And then you would go and live somewhere and then you would learn the dialect. Mm -hmm. And it sounds sort of like Shakespearean English. It's frankly ridiculous mm -hmm. when you hear it spoken. And that's what I learned when I went through. And yeah, and what Bob learned as well. So what we did in the years after 9-11 as a result of the demand of our customer is we developed full 15-month dialect courses. And the product of that, uh, it's, it's, it's changing the way Arabic is taught in universities. Mm -hmm. And the product is this amazingly agile, proficient linguist that not only understands modern standard, in other words, can read and write, but it has this capability and facility with the spoken language and by extension, the cultural acuity that's, that's really remarkable. You just mentioned something in passing in that that caught my attention. You spoke about your customer can, can you talk a little bit about the business side? I, again, being somewhat familiar with your school, it's not run by the government, or is it? So our graduates are uniform, right? So they're uniform military, and we go to work for the federal government. Mm -hmm. So that would be your customer who you're serving. So right. So our customer, when I say our customer, it is the Department of Defense, 
our embassies. So the State Department mm -hmm. is a consumer of DLI graduates, the officers primarily, foreign area officers, which is what I did, uh, working in the Middle East and Kuwait and Jordan are, at our embassies, and, and the intelligence community which is where a lot of our graduates go to work. Is it funded by the government or is it? It is, it's, okay. it's budgeted, it's an army school. Mm -hmm. Its budget comes through the army, but it is watched carefully. Absolutely. By, by the intelligence community so that it's adequately funded. Yeah. And so election years and things like that are very important to you guys because your funding is tied to the current state of who's doing what. You bet. And in budget cycles where, you know, we're currently under the Budget Control Act or sequestration, you can imagine there are severe budget cuts that go on and DLI has not been immune to that. But at the same time, there's an understanding that the graduates of DLI aren't optional. Yeah. They are a critical national security capability that has to continue to stream like blood into the organizations that utilize them in order to provide the U.S. the capability it has. Yeah. After 9-11, there was this huge discussion of the declining availability of linguists in the United States, that there were fewer university courses and still a large focus on Russian, which mm -hmm. wasn't the enemy anymore. How has that changed in the last 15 years? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So when I came to DLI in 1996 to study Arabic, Arabic was growing. And it was growing as a result of Desert Storm, the end of the Cold War in 89, Desert Storm in 91, the realization that the Middle East was going to be sort of in a state of not only turmoil, but clearly a, a national security focus for the United States. And so DLI's Arabic program was growing at the time. When I came back here in 2008, it had grown to the largest program at DLI, and it had developed dialect programs as well as modern standard. And it was a critical, critical program that fed these Arabic speakers out into not only the government, but by extension into the larger federal government and into the business community because... Are we graduating enough students or do we need to develop this more? Oh, that's a great question. So there is, from the perspective of many, there is not nearly enough emphasis on foreign language education, in particular at the primary and secondary levels, yeah. where language, as you might imagine, as, as you know, young people are very, very receptive, right? Yeah, right? Receptive. And so there's a critical shortfall there. And then on, onward at the university level, there's similarly not nearly enough focus. DLI is just fortunate because we literally get our requirements from the federal government. We get a budget from the federal government to train the, the linguist to fulfill that requirement. And we do, and I'll elaborate a little bit on that. After 9-11, not only did we need Arabic speakers, but we needed Pashto speakers mm -hmm. and Dari speakers and Urdu speakers. And frankly, those programs in the United States, if they existed at all, were tiny. Mm -hmm. So the, the growth at DLI in those language programs was explosive. And again, the incredible talent at DLI recruited very bright, young, not necessarily young, very bright, talented uh, native speakers wrote curriculum, wrote tests, started classes in these languages, and then grew them to the point where when I came here in 2008, Pashtu, Dari, Urdu were robust, hundreds and hundreds of students programs per language, separate and distinct from Arabic. But I'm curious, you, you made a comment that it's a, an international joke, right? A person who speaks several languages, a polyglot, three languages, trilingual, two languages, bilingual, one American, <laughs> <Yep>. right? <laughs> so how do you get Americans from Minnesota or Idaho or Kansas to come here and learn a language and learn a language that they never heard of or and, and how do you determine their proficiency or their aptitude and please tell me it's changing please tell me people are more interested that the joke is gonna run out soon yeah yeah I, you know I wish I could oh I wish I could I think <laughs> I, I think the joke still rings appropriate true. yeah well but this is very good for the language business in general because the less people know languages, the more you need translations. Oh, that's true. It, it, yeah. No, no, it bodes very well for your business. Uh, but I would say this. I would say that, first of all, the number of students wanting to come to DLI is greater than ever. And basically, here's how it works. I mean, young people walk into a recruiter's office. They want to be soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines. They start taking tests. And if you score very, very high on the initial battery of tests, which are sort of general like SAT type tests, then you're invited back to take this 
test I referred to earlier called the Defense Language Aptitude Battery. And it's a test on a made-up language. Mm. Very strange test. Oh. Very strange test. And depending on how you score on that determines, A, whether you are even eligible for language study, and if you are, what difficulty of language you can study. It's a made-up language? So that's awesome. Is it something that can be learned or is it, does your brain work that way? So I had never seen a test like it before and you don't get any prep. You don't get to take it twice. You just take it, but it's a very good indicator of mm -hmm. aptitude. It's a well-designed test. Now here's what it doesn't test. It doesn't test motivation. Mm. It doesn't assess for biographical sketch background. And so take me for example, I go in, I score and I, I was fortunate. I scored well on it. It didn't tell the army that I spoke a Semitic language already. Mm -hmm. And so when I came to DLI, being a Syrian speaker, Arabic for me was much easier. It's one of the most difficult languages for an English speaker to learn, but I'm an English speaker, but I also speak a Semitic language. So for me, Arabic was much easier to learn. The D-Lab doesn't test for that, the Defense Language Aptitude Battery. The revised test, which should be fielded now, was under development when I was in command and it should be in the field now, asks for biographical background and it has sort of a component that tests for motivation because it's so important. You can take somebody that's off the charts yeah. aptitude wise and they go in the classroom and they just don't have the will, the desire to endure this very uncomfortable and intense academic environment and they'll wash out. And so getting a better holistic view of the candidates is really important, not only for their success, but in terms of not wasting resources. Out of curiosity, can we have access to an old of test like this? I'd love to <laughs> he take He wants to test. take it. <laughs> the army wants you. Yeah, and if you come. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it's not the first time. Languages, it's right? the first <laughs> Do you know, you're probably seeing students come in who have grown up on the internet. So device in their pocket, what do they call them? Internet natives, I believe. Has the technology changed the way language is taught? Absolutely. And it's a great question, Michael. So what's happened from the time I was at DLI, where we had cassette tapes, we had printed textbooks, to now is a, a kind of a sea change. And the change is driven by technology and the internet. So DLI now has campus-wide Wi-Fi. It has a academic network, so a .edu that we're familiar with seeing at yep. most universities, DLI has moved to an academic network rather than a military network because military networks are there to for information assurance. They're not there to enable education. Mm. And so because of those security protocols, we could not access native content at certain overseas locations. We couldn't have the ease of Wi-Fi and portability in terms of smartphones and iPads and other devices. And so DLI deployed an academic network separate and distinct from the military network. Every student goes down and is issued an iPad and they are able to access authentic material, is the term we mm -hmm. use in general, authentic audio, video, written content, and it's very timely. Your textbooks aren't 15 years old and, and getting older by the day. Your lessons can be weeks old, days old, maybe even hours old, based on the content an instructor wants to go in, download, edit, and use and deploy in the classroom. It's wonderful. It, it adds currency and authenticity that we simply didn't have before. And you're right, our students come in and it's like breathing. Mm -hmm. Our faculty, not so much, right? So our faculty have an education and training challenge yeah. where their students are more potentially more literate in technology than they are, especially depending on where from the world they come. So it's a very interesting challenge we have now with training and education of our faculty, but that's how it's changed and it's, it's wonderful. Other languages, is there still interest for European languages? Is there still interest for... We're probably competing with the Germans on a lot of the listening we do around the world, so... <laughs> So Spanish, <laughs> Portuguese, French are, are robust languages at, at, at DLI. And interestingly, some of that demand is driven by continental needs. In other words, our, our requirements for communication, translation on the European continent. Some of it is colonial, right? French is spoken throughout Africa, mm -hmm. Portuguese in large, large parts of the world due to colonial presence. And Spanish. And Spanish the same way. So these are still really large programs. Asian programs, as you might guess, Chinese is huge. Japanese is still taught, Korean of huge importance based on what's going on and the, continues to happen on the peninsula there and the challenges posed to the US potentially. And then 
Farsi. Yeah. So it's it's very geopolitical. It's it very really is. yes. It really it's is. fantastic. Yeah. Well, Michael, what do you think? I think this is our best show until now. It absolutely is. Dino, this is this is fabulous. You guys um, are very good. Kind. I've learned, I've been challenged. I want to take a test that is in something made up. <laughs> Let's go back to that question. Do we would we have access to one of these tests that we could share with our <laughs> listeners? You know, I think it's really, really well protected. I yeah, would, for, so. for, I would imagine for good reason. Yeah. I, Renato, I'll write one for you. Yeah, hey, we'll no, see. I, I, will, I will tell you a little story. Actually, around 1993, I created a made up language, and I created because I did a, when I had my business in Brazil. I needed translators, but there were no schools and there wasn't anything. And so I created a training course that was called Techniques in Technical Translation. And regardless of language, I would get a person that had language skills in any pair of language and teach them the 13 translation techniques. And the way that I tested them, I had this case study that I was an adventurer that went to the Easter Island and was the first person to really decipher Rongo Rongo. And there was this 130 word text and a dictionary all made up and the people needed to translate. And this language had only passive voice and things like that. So all the challenges in translation and they had to convert from passive to active and so on. So this is why I was fascinated. I wanted to, I invented one. I wanted to see another one like that. I love it. Dina, we want to give you a chance to say uh, last words, anything you would like to encourage our listeners on or. I'll tell you this. I'll reiterate that Monterey is really fortunate to have Moravia here. And we are very, very rich in not only in language and culture capabilities and this whole notion of being in the language capital of the world, but we're all the more rich because Moravia is now part of the fabric of our community. So I'm excited to stay engaged with and see how Moravia evolves here, how DLI continues to be a part of it, and how together we sort of help not only the United States, but the global situation hopefully uh, move away from conflict and, and prosper and interact in a more effective manner. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for taking the time with me today. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you very uh, much. Maybe we'll be able to do a check-in and we can let you know how it's going down the road here in Monterey. Love it is lovely to be here and thank you for your work and the hospitality that's been shown to us. Our pleasure. Thanks. Thank you for listening to Globally Speaking, brought to you by Moravia. We'd like to hear your comments, suggestions, and feedback. So until next time, please visit online at www.globallyspeakingradio.com.